We're going to talk for a little bit about the anatomy of the optic nerve and the retinal nerve fiber layer, structures that are affected in glaucoma that we really need to know something about. As I emphasize throughout this curriculum, glaucoma is damage to the optic nerve. And so this talk will focus on the anatomy of the nerve and a little bit about theories regarding the damage that occurs to the nerve. The part of the nerve that we can see, the visible optic nerve head, is also called the optic disc or papilla, but most of us would call it the optic nerve head. What we see on average in ophthalmoscopy is about 1.75 millimeters in diameter. But there is a wide range of optic nerve sizes, up to seven-fold difference in area between individuals. This image appears also in the optic nerve exam part of this curriculum. These are optic nerves of two different people. The right optic nerve you can see has a disc area of 4.18 square millimeters. The left eye, again a different person, optic disc area of 1.34 square millimeters. That's a, a difference of over threefold. In section nine, which discusses the changes that occur in optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber, we'll go over all the clinical manifestations of optic nerve damage. The optic nerve is made up of up to a million and a quarter axons. They are divided in the nerve by septa into about 1,000 fascicles, which we can see here in this histopathology slide. These darker pink lines are the septa that divide the optic nerve into fascicles. The cell bodies are in the ganglion cell layer of the retina and they synapse in the lateral geniculate body in the brain. This is a high resolution OCT scan of my retina. You can see the foveal pit. You can see the optic nerve head there. The retinal nerve fiber layer, which is very thin over the central macula because everything is displaced away from the fovea. And then the ganglion cell layer and interplexiform layers, which are a little bit hard to separate out on OCT. In the axons, there is axoplasmic transport that carries nutrients from the ganglion cell bodies to the lateral geniculate, a really pretty long course when you think about it. That's called orthograde flow. And waste then goes back to the ganglion cell, and that is retrograde flow. There are three principal types of ganglion cells, parvocellular, magnocellular, and coniocellular, also called bistratified. Parvocellular are the most numerous. They make up about 80% of our ganglion cells. They are small diameter, small receptive fields, mostly in the central retina, rapid conduction velocities, and they respond to color in fine detail, not so much motion, but when you're reading a book or hopefully watching this presentation using your parvocellular ganglion cells. The M cells, uh, magnocellular, large, they're fewer in number. They represent about 10% of the ganglion cells. They're larger diameter. They're sensitive to change in luminance and dim environments, and they detect motion. They have large receptive field, so they're really not much good for fine detail. And slower conduction velocities than the P cells. And then the K cells or coniocellular are also bistratified cells. Also, like the M cells, represent about 10% of axons. And they process information regarding blue-yellow color opponency. And that's the basis of short wavelength automated perimetry or SWAP. If we go back to talking about these cells, both the M and K cells, because there are so few of them, 
uh, relative to the P cells. A lot of attempts have been made to determine early glaucoma damage based on loss of the M cells or K cells because there's not a lot of redundancy in that system. So that's the basis, for example, of short wavelength automated perimetry. So when you think about how the axons are organized in the fundus, you would expect them to be like the spokes of a bicycle wheel, just coming towards the optic nerve head. If we think of this as the optic nerve head, that the fibers would just extend out like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. But when you look at the actual retina, that does happen out here. Things are pretty much like bicycle spokes, but there is the papillomacular bundle between the macula and the optic nerve head that contributes a huge amount of the optic nerve structure. And the fibers that are going to the more temporal portion of the retina need to arc around that big papillomacular bundle and we get these arcing fibers. Those fibers do not cross the temporal raphe, which is right here. And this picture of a patient with myelinated nerve fibers is beautifully shows the temporal raphe. You can see how the nerve fibers above and below come together but do not cross. The axons from the most peripheral retina travel deeper in the retinal nerve fiber layer and exit in the most peripheral portion of the optic nerve, where the ones that are closer to the optic nerve are more superficial, as you can see here in the black arrow, and travel down the central portion of the optic nerve. If we look at the optic nerve in cross-section, there are four main regions. There's a surface nerve fiber layer that we can see. Just behind that, the prelaminar area, laminar, and then retrolaminar. We'll talk about these in a couple of different ways. Again, the superficial nerve fiber layer is the visible portion of the nerve, almost entirely made up of axons, a few astrocytes sprinkled in there. The prelaminar region is the part of the optic nerve right below the surface layer right above the lamina it lines up as you can see here with the choroid right there again made up mostly of axons and again a few astrocytes the axons then travel through the lamina cribrosa so the lamina region is contiguous with the sclera it's the porous portion, uh, portion of the sclera that allows uh, axons to travel through, made up of, of sheets of connected tissue and elastic fibers. It supports the nerve tissue as that tissue exits through the sclera. The fenestrations in the lamina are larger superiorly and inferiorly and there is speculation that these larger pores provide less support and may explain the propensity for superior and inferior optic nerve head damage. Sometimes you can see the lamina as you can in this uh, patient with a very deep cup. You can see that pattern in the depth of the cup of these laminar pores. That can be seen both in glaucomatous optic nerves, but also in normal optic nerves. It's really not a tremendously helpful finding. And then as we move farther back in the retro laminar region, then the optic nerve begins to take on myelination and therefore doubles in diameter to about three millimeters. And it's surrounded then by meninges, the pia, arachnoid, and dura. All of the blood supply comes from the ophthalmic artery via the central retinal artery and the posterior ciliary arteries. So the central retinal artery supplies the nerve fiber layer and the retrolaminar region of the optic nerve. The posterior ciliary arteries 
of which there are one to five, branch into short posterior ciliary arteries from 10 to 20 of those that enter the sclera around the optic nerve and can form a circle called the circle of Zinhaler. They supply the anterior optic nerve, the prelaminar, laminar regions, and occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries can lead to anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. If we think about it, let's go layer by layer now and talk about the blood supply. So the visible portion of the optic nerve, superficial nerve fiber layer, is supplied by the central retinal artery and also from ciliaretinal arteries when they're present and they're not present in everyone. You can see one right there. The prelaminar laminar regions are supplied from the short posterior ciliary arteries that enter through the sclera. The retrolaminar region has branches from the central retinal artery, but also branches that come in from the pia. Venous drainage is virtually all through the central retinal vein. This is a histopath of a cupped optic nerve. What we would see then is thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layers, and posterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa. How does glaucoma damage happen? It's still not totally clear. There is interruption of axoplasmic flow theories for the underlying etiology by being either a vascular etiology or direct pressure on the axons. So many feel the damage that occurs at lower pressures is more likely vascular in origin, while damage at higher pressures is more likely as barotrauma. Everything in between is a little, perhaps a little bit of both. So the key points, the visible part of the optic nerve is on average about 1.75 millimeters in diameter, made up of up to 1.2 million axons. There are three ganglion cell types, parvocellular, magnocellular, and coniocellular, and 80% are P cells, parvocellular. There are four regions of the optic nerve, the blood supply is complex, all branches of the ophthalmic artery. And those that comes via the central retinal artery and the posterior ciliary arteries, and then some contribution from the pia to the retrolaminar portion. The theories for optic nerve head damage are vascular and barotrauma and a combination of both. So this is just an overview of the anatomy of the structures that are damaged in glaucoma. In section nine, we'll definitely get into talking about what you will see as an examiner when you look at patients who have glaucoma.